All right, well, good morning. Hopefully everybody's having a great day and a great week. Um, that was interesting weather yesterday that we experienced. So it was beautiful all day long. It was hot. I was able to go paintball, which is always, you know, a good day for me. And then, uh, then the skies opened up. And wow, we were out and about uh, when, the, when the rain came down. And it was amazing how much standing water happened in such little time. You know, it was impressive. But, you know, based on the songs we sang in worship, and um, it was just a breathtaking to watch those flashes of lightning, you know, and hear that rolling thunder. And uh, one thing I learned from watching Back to the Future is that lightning is greater than 1.21 gigawatts of energy, which is extreme amounts. I mean, the power in that is just amazing. And so we were out running errands when this, all this started happening. And uh, we were running off to uh, Michael's to get a picture frame because there's an old photo that I've had on the wall for a long time and the, the frame broke. And it's one of those uh, old time, old fashioned photos where you go and you dress up. Uh, well, long ago when I was showing cattle, we went to the fairs a lot we would you know, usually do one of those fair booth old time photos. And I've got one with uh, my kids when they were nublets. I'll translate that meaning small sized children. Um, so they were, I'm guessing maybe five and eight, six and nine kind of age bracket. And they were there with their cousins and all dressed up like in Civil War outfits and you know, old west type things and it's pretty cool. And, uh, you know, I look at those photos of the kids back then, knowing who they are today, and you look at them and you're like, wow, physically they've changed so much, but they've changed in their behavior, in their actions, in their understanding, in their morals, in their conduct. So much has changed from the time that they were little children to the adults that they've grown into today. And I look back at them, you know, and I always wanted to be a dad, and I did my best to be a good dad to them. And so I tried to teach them, you know, uh, important, you know, morals and ethics, and, you know, you, you gotta suck it up and tough it out, and, you know, you gotta put in the work, and be truthful, and work hard, keep your word, you know, be a person of your word, and be kind. Those are the lessons I try to teach them. But it pains me a little bit to accept the fact that those aren't the only things they learned from me. Um, I've taught them lessons, but they've observed me. They've learned from my conduct. They learned how to road rage, how to get upset with somebody for driving too slow or cutting me off. I didn't teach, I didn't set out to teach them that lesson, but they learned it from me nonetheless. Uh, they likely learned from me that, oh, white lies are good, you don't want to hurt people's feelings. And um, one thing I can say that they did learn from me was uh, alcohol is normal. It's normal for people to drink a lot and even get drunk once in a while. I never meant to teach them that lesson, but they learned it from me nonetheless. And so, you know, I look at that photo and I look at you know, all the things I could have done better, and, and it's too late for that, you know. They are the product of the lessons I taught them, whether intentional or not. So with that in mind, I just want to recap on where we left off two weeks ago when we were talking about David and uh, Bathsheba, and, you know, horrible topic, a lot of wicked, evil things going on. So David commits these horrific sins against Bathsheba, against Uriah the husband, but most importantly, he committed these sins against the Lord Almighty when he betrayed uh, the Lord's desires and will. In uh, 2 Samuel eleven thirteen, we read, Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sins. You, will not, you are not going to die. And we learned from that that David came to a point where he saw his sins 
And he, he acknowledged them, and he, he said, Lord, I have sinned against you. And there's an understanding of repentance here because, you know, he spared. His, his sins are, um, as Nathan said, uh, taken away. And then we read from the other translations where it said, the Lord has, has allowed your sins to pass in the NASB. And uh, King James said, the Lord also hath put away thy sins. And so we talked about forbearance and the, this putting off of sins. But that came from a repentant heart from David, first and foremost. Then, because of all the wickedness, the Lord had spared him from the judgment of his sins. But he said, but you got some bad stuff coming your way. The consequences of your actions are going to come around. You set that first domino in motion, and now it's all going to come tumbling down around you. And so the Lord warns him. Um, and then we're going to skip past some of the verses. We're going to be reading from 18, uh, 2 Samuel 18. But in that gap, some of the stuff that happens is David's own son, Absalom, uh, basically fulfills the warning that the Lord had given David. You know, all the stuff that was going to happen, it came from the hands of his own son, his own child. His own son, Absalom, committed wicked acts of evil. Um, the first one was he forced himself on a stepsister. And when David learned about this, he did nothing. Even though David helped unwillingly and unknowingly facilitate that, he did nothing. And then Absalom goes and kills his brother, and David did nothing. Absalom flees because he knows judgment's coming. And then uh, when Absalom wants to come back, David allows it. He lets him come back. And then, you know, as soon as he comes back, uh, the son attempts to steal his father's crown, running him out of power, and fulfilling all the warnings that the Lord had given him. Absalom did great evil and great wickedness. Um, David was a great military leader. He was a slayer of lions and bears and giants. You know, he was, he was mighty, and yet he did not respond to the treachery of his own son. And it's interesting, and we're going to talk about that, you know, why he would choose to flee instead of fight when his nature was that of a warrior. Um, and then once in the palace, Absalom defiles David's concubines in order to establish his own authority. Like, this is my house now. I'm the king. And he did wickedness in order to establish that. So all this happens, which brings us to 2 Samuel 18. And we're going to be reading 1 through 15, and then jumping ahead to uh, 31 through 33. And it said, and this is after uh, David flees from the palace. It says, David mustered the men who were with him and, and appointed over them commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds. David sent out his troops, a third under the command of Jacob, a third under Jacob's brother Abs Abishai, uh, son of Zariah, and a third under Id Idai, the Gittite. Uh, the king told the troops, I myself will surely march out with you. But the men said, you must not go. If we are forced to flee, they don't care about us. Even if half of us die, they won't care. But you are worth 10,000 of us. It would be better now uh, for you to give us support from the city. The king answered, I will do whatever seems best to you. The king commanded Joab, uh, Abishai, and Ittai, uh, it Ittai, be gentle with the young man Absalom for my sake. And all the troops heard the king give, the, give uh, the king giving orders concerning Absalom to each of the commanders. David's army marched out of the city to fight Israel. And that right there is just sounds interesting. David's fighting Israel. I'm sorry. Uh, and the battle took place in the forest of Ephraim. There, Israel's troops were routed by David's men, and the casualties that day were great. 20,000 men. 
the battle, the battle spread out over the whole countryside, and the forest swallowed up more men that day than the sword. Now Absalom hap- happened to meet David's men. He was riding his mule, and as the mule went under a thick branch of a large oak, Absalom's hair got caught in the tree. He was left hanging in midair, while the mule he was riding kept on going. When one of the men saw what had happened, he told Jacob, I have seen, or Joab, I have seen Absalom hanging in the oak tree. Joab said to the, to the man, sorry, I'm getting a little bit of an echo. Uh, Joab said to the man who had told him this, what, you saw him? Why didn't you strike him to the ground right there? Then I would have given you uh, 10 shackles of silver and a warrior's belt. But the man replied, even if a thousand shackles were, uh, were weighed out into my hand, I would not lay a hand on the king's son. In our hearing the king's command, you and Abishai and Nittai uh, uh, protect the young man Absalom for my sake. And if I had put my life in jeopardy and nothing is hidden from the king, you would have kept your distance from me. Joab said, I am not going to wait like this for you. He took three javelins in his hand and plunged them into Absalom's heart while uh, Absalom was still alive in the oak tree and the ten of Joab's armor bearers surrounded Absalom, struck him, and killed him. And then we're going to jump ahead to 31. And it says, When the Cushite arrived and said, My lord, the king, uh, hear the good news. The Lord has vindicated you today and delivered you from the hands of all who have rose up against you. The king asked, asked the, the Cushite, Is the young man Absalom safe? The Cushite replied, May the enemy of my lord, the king, and all who rise up to harm you be like that young man. The king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. As he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Let's open in prayer. Father God, for those of us that uh, have children, I think we can relate. The love we have, the desire to protect, um, the grieving when they're lost. Father God, we just pray that you would, uh, we just want to lift up all of our children right now. Each and every one of us who have children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, we lift them up. Lord, we just want them to respond to your grace, to come to know you, to repent and be saved, to not be lost. Father God, help us, give us the words to speak to them, words that are loving and compelling, that would help them, encourage them to turn to you. Father God, we just ask that you bless this day, bless this message, and bless all those here in Jesus' name. Amen. So the story starts out interestingly, where it says, I myself will surely march with you. David's a warrior. You know, battle was nothing new to him. And he was willing, even though he was about 60 at this age, he was like, let's go, I will lead you. Um, But the men said to him, no, it's better that you don't go. I appreciate the fact, and, and the king answers, I will do whatever you see is best. Right. I appreciate the fact that, for me, this is further evidence of his repentant heart. Because he wasn't the, I'm going to go do what I want, when I want, with whomever I want. I'm going to you know, lead and, and charge forward. There's an act of, or, or a presence of humility here, where he's like, okay, if that's what you think is best, I will, I will respect your opinion. I will you know, take your advice and, and heed to it. Um, David was leading about 4,000 people, they suspect, you know, right in that ballpark. It wasn't a lot of people. And so it's, again, interesting that when the battle ensues, it says that the battle spread over the whole countryside. The forest swallowed up more men that day than the sword. About 20,000 people had fallen though he only commanded about 4,000. 
That's pretty miraculous. It's pretty amazing. When you visualize 40,000 or 4,000 against 20 plus thousand, not even sure, and you know you see that disparity of force, and then you realize the real victor that day, the one that was the most triumphant in the whole battle, was the forest. The forest was the great military force that day. Greater than David's army, greater than Israel's army. The force, the hand of God, the creation of God was the greatest force out there. Um, and so the battle ensues, and when it said more people fell uh, at the, by the forest, by the countryside itself, it can imply a great many things. You know, it, it could be that God unleashed beasts on them. You know, the bears and lions came out and had a feast. Uh, it could have been that you know, there was confusion in them, and some of them walked off of cliffs. Some of them may have been entangled in the trees, just like Absalom was, and, and they were made dysfunctional or, or maybe you know, harmed in that way. It, there's a great multitude of ways the Lord may have acted in order for the force to be as effective as it was. But God was involved here, and the force moved. For me, this isn't one of the takeaways, but no matter how outnumbered you feel, no matter how the, the numbers seem stacked against you, uh, 40 against, or 4,000 against 20 plus thousand people, as long as the Lord is with you, as long as the Lord's hand is moving in your favor, as long as you are doing the Lord's will, nothing's impossible. Right. Nothing is impossible. Yeah. What an amazing triumph here. Mm -hmm. Now, it goes on to say that, now Absalom happened to meet David's men while he was riding the mule. Um, and as the mule went under the trees, Absalom's hair got caught in the tree, right? His hair got caught in the tree. Absalom was defeated. I think literally and figuratively by pride. His pride is what defeated him. Second Samuel fourteen twenty five, and I don't have the verse here. Um, it, no, okay. Um, it says, in all of Israel, there was not a man so highly praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. He was a good looking guy. And apparently he had long flowing hair. Um, and so, he was happy about his good looks. I mean, I would like to know what that feels like. Um, I'm sure, you know, he had the whole hair thing going on. And his hair is what... Most warriors would tie their stuff up in a bun or, you know, you watch MMA fights and at least the women will braid their hair because they don't want the hair being used against them when it comes, you know, hand-to-hand -hand time. Um, he didn't do that. He left his hair flowing and his hair is what tangled him up and caught him up. So I think, you know, figuratively the pride got him because he went against his dad, you know, and pride does that. But literally the hair is what caught up. So, so why, why did David desire to protect his son after the evil he had done, the great evil that he had done in sinning against his stepsister, his brother, and murdering him and against the Lord? and against his own father. David still loved him and wanted to protect him. David knew he deserved death for the sins. It was unspeakable. He had inadvertent, when David committed his sins with Bathsheba, he knew they were a death sentence too. In fact, he accidentally condemned himself to death when he pro made that proclamation. But the big difference is David repented and when David repented, grace was given to him, and there was forbearance, and his sins were not held against him. There was no judgment. One of my primary takeaways from last week's message with Ev was grace. We have to give grace. Grace to one another. After committing horrible sins, David received grace. He then experienced a true heart change. There was a, a, a shift in his personality, which I believe led to the humility that he experienced uh, when counseling with his warriors, his generals. He extended that same grace to his son. The grace that he received, he extended. 
Um, I also believe that David may have felt responsible or in some ways strongly contributed to Absalom's actions. Now, each adult is, is accountable for their own actions, but we can contribute to it. We can, you know, uh, set the stage in a way that encourages them to do horrific things. Um, he was, after all, responsible and accountable for raising this child in the ways of the Lord, as a parent is. And so there was that degree of accountability as well. The Lord told David that these consequences would happen, and he had no idea it would come from his son. But as I said earlier, our children learn from watching us. They learn most of their lessons from watching us and not what we say. And keeping that in mind, David desired Bathsheba, someone that was forbidden to him. She was already married. She was off limits. David disregarded that and did what he wanted anyway. And Absalom was watching. Absalom said, oh, you want stuff and you just take it? Well, you're the king and I'm the prince. Okay. I mean, I'm reading into this a little bit, but I could totally see that perspective. You know, and then, you know, for David to protect himself from the husband who was going to come home sooner or later and do, you know, biological math and realize things were not right, David goes and kills the husband. Absalom was watching. Oh, so it's okay to kill people that are a threat to you. Well, the brother of the woman I defiled is a threat to me, so I'm just doing like you, Dad. You know, I can totally see that rationale. So I can see where David, having committed these horrific acts, and then having his child kind of follow in his footsteps, that's a hard thing to reconcile, you know. We can seek forgiveness and we can receive grace. And I can see David saying, oh, Lord, you've done so much for me. You've taken away this punishment I deserve. Can't you help my son learn that lesson for me too? Can't he learn to repent as well as I did? Can you teach him somehow to turn away from the wickedness and, and walk in your steps once again? And I look back at some of the things in my past with my children, and I think, if only I had, I really wish I could have. If I could go back, I would do it this way. And whenever I fall into that pit, that snare, that trap, my wife is really quick to say, and I've said it here before, um, you did the best you could with the knowledge you had at the time. And that's true. And it's cruel and unjust for me to judge the old me by the new me. Because I've, the Lord has taught me so much. The Lord had taught David so much. And so he was extending grace to his son. You know, I've come to see the errors in my ways, and I want my children to see the errors and repent in the ways that they need to for their errors. Uh, David repented and turned to the Lord, and, um, and I can just see his heart breaking, saying, Absalom, repent. It's not too late until it was too late. Now, I had a quote that I was going to put on the board because I do like my quotes. And um, it was by uh, uh, Charles Spurgeon. But the quote was so good that it kept growing and growing and growing. And it became more like something I'm going to read to you. So please bear with me. This is a little bit lengthy, but it, it's really good stuff. Um, what a noble passion is a mother's love or a father's love. It is an image and miniature of the love of God. How reverent ought we treat it. How marvel marvelously has God been pleased to endow, especially godly people, with the sacred instinct of affection towards their children, an instinct which God sanctifies to noble ends. Our children may plunge into the worst sins, but they are our children still. They may scoff at our God. They may tear out our hearts to pieces with their wickedness. We cannot take complacency in them. But at the same time, we cannot unchild them. 
nor erase their image from our hearts. We do earnestly remember them still and shall do so as long as, our, as these hearts of ours shall beat within our bosom. I have now and then met this professing Christian who have said, that girl shall never darken this door again. I do not believe in their Christianity. Whenever I met, uh, have met with fathers who are, in, who are irreconcilable with their children, I am convinced that they are unreconciled to God. It cannot be possible for there, there should exist in us a feeling of enmity with our own offspring after our hearts have been renewed. For if the Lord has forgiven us and receives us into his family, surely we can forgive the chief of those who have offended us. And when they are our, our, our own flesh and blood, we are doubly bound to do so. To cast off our own children is unnatural, and that which is unnatural cannot be gracious. There's a love that we have for our children, and they may wrong us, they may reject our God, they may reject our beliefs, but we still pray for them. We still give them grace. We still want them to learn the lessons that we have to teach them, lessons that God can restore. God can transform. God can make anew things that are dead. I will always cherish Jerry Kester because he was, the two things he really imparted to me is give grace. Give grace. And the other was be humble. Be humble. Except for two instances, which we just talked about yesterday with somebody. Those two instances are... If somebody accuses you of uh, sexual or financial improprieties, especially in the church, especially if you're the pastor, then you defend yourself. But other than that, you be humble and you extend grace. David mourned Absalom deeply because he knew his son had died in the midst of his sin, unrepentant and unforgiven. His son died the same physical death that we're all going to face sooner or later, but worse, he died a spiritual death. And by spiritual death, I mean an eternity of enmity and distance from him and God. An eternity of spiritual death. I can understand why David said, it would be better for me to have died than my son. Because David was reconciled with the Lord. If I could trade my physical, well, my, don't tell my wife, if I could trade my physical life for the spiritual life of my children, I'd do it. Only with her consent, but um, I wouldn't want to leave her abandoned. But, you know, I, I think she'd come on board with that, you know, to save our children. Because that's the love a, a child, a, a father or, or a parent has for their children. Um, we, I, can allow the guilt of our past actions impede our judgment and impact our current decisions, especially when dealing with our children. Uh, it's good for us to atone for our sinful actions, but it's not good to allow wickedness, wickedness to flourish around us. One of the questions I have about David was, when that first offense occurred, why didn't he step up and say, son, this is not okay, and we're dealing with this now? And when the second offense happened, why didn't David deal with it right then and there? And I have to believe that him, what he did with his sister, probably wasn't the first sign of something being wrong. You know, he could have approached it before that even, I think. But he didn't. And I think and we can be guilty of this, and I know I am, sometimes we let the guilt of what we've been forgiven of, the guilt that we've been washed clean of, pull into our judgment and prevent us from doing what is right now. And we need to not do that. We need to be guarded against the, judge, the, the, you know, the convictions of the past stopping us from doing God's word right now, work right now. Um... I'm going to read through Ephesians really quick. We're going to read uh, 4.25 through 5.2 to give it a New Testament applicable uh, 
context. And it says, therefore, each of you must put off falsehoods and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. If you're, if you're in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, anger, or, or ra bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgive each other, just as Christ God forgave you. In following God's example, therefore, as dear, dearly loved children, and walking in the ways of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. If someone offends you, even your own child, give grace. Admonish and confront accordingly, but do it in love. Not to express your grievances against them, but in the hope of their repentance, or if necessary, your own repentance. But we need to act in love and in grace. If others are to learn from your actions, if others are going to witness you and get lessons from your life, let them be lessons of how to love fully. Let them be lessons of how to give grace, whether deserved or not. Demonstrate humility. Let that be the lesson they're learning from you. How to express compassion to one another. Let us be teachers of these things to the world around us. And I just want to close by saying, you know, I've received a lot of compliments lately. Um, one of the best compliments I've received happened last week when my daughter was visiting. She basically said, I'm a completely different person than one I was when she was a kid. What a wonderful compliment. She sees the work of God in my life. She sees the growth, the change, that restoration. I want that to be the lesson she learns. I want her to say, there's a peace about you. There's a joy and a love about you. I want to learn more about that. Oh, that's what, that's what we pray for, that our children will see that change, that they will learn that lesson, and they would come to know Jesus fully and repent. So that's the impact I want to have on her. So our takeaways from today. Those that have received the grace of God through his mercy must be merciful and generously share grace with others. We're just supposed to be conduits of the grace. The grace comes in and it flows out. We can't be a dam that stops it up. Uh, the next takeaway. The proud and arrogant take what they want. The humble will receive and consider the counsel of others, as David did. The pride of Absalom caused his death, figuratively and literally. Woe unto the prideful. The next takeaway, if you feel like the odds are against you and the enemy's army is about to overrun you, fear not. God could even use a forest to carry out his will. That's pretty amazing. Um, the next takeaway, the enemy wants us to cover up our sins with more sins. You may succeed in hiding things from others, but you'll never hide them from God. I think that was a leftover from last one. Um, and then the last takeaway. For if the Lord has forgiven us and receives us into his family, surely we, we can forgive the chief of those who have offended us. Thank you, Mr. Spurgeon.
Thank you. Let's close in prayer. Oh, Lord, help us. Help us be the parents we're meant to be. And not even just to, you know, our own biological offspring, but to the youth. The youth are so confused this, these days. I'm not convinced they haven't always been confused, but now it seems like the culture itself is encouraging and fostering that confusion to, to new heights. I'm still unsure if uh, it's always been this way or if the curtain's just been revealed and it's, it's easier to see now, but Lord, help us have an impact with the children, the young, the impressionable, the ones that are desiring to learn lessons but perhaps don't have anybody to teach them. Let our lives be the lesson. Let our actions be emulated that people will become Christ-like. Just as Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Lord, help me to become as Christ-like as possible so people can emulate you as they copy me. I just want to be used by you for your glory, as we all do. Pray that you would bless us. Bless our hearts. Give us compassion for others. Teach us how to share grace more freely. And Lord, as we close in prayer, I will just uh, say that please bless our fellowship time as we go uh, next door to the fellowship hall and pray that you bless our conversations, that we uh, maybe practice our, our lesson giving to one another. Uh, pray that you bless the food to our bodies and pray that you continue blessing this church. We ask that you give... Uh, safe uh, passage and uh, return to the Bergmans uh, as they uh, enjoy this time of rest. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So the blessing is this. Therefore, go, freely receiving and freely giving God's grace.